Why should we accept moral realism? Is there evidence moral values are objectively true? What reasons can moral realists offer? In the last video, we explained what moral realism was and what it was not. But now, we will go over the various arguments given by philosophers to infer that moral realism is true. As with all philosophical arguments, these are not proof moral realism is true, but the evidence they provide shows it is far more likely to be the case. The first argument is the argument from epistemic realism, put forward by Terence Cuneo. The argument is as follows. Premise 1. If moral facts do not exist, then epistemic facts do not exist. Premise 2. Epistemic facts do exist. Conclusion 1. Moral facts do exist. Premise 3. If moral facts do exist, then moral realism is true. And the final conclusion is, moral realism is true. The problem that Cuneo identifies is how can a moral skeptic prescribe epistemic oughts while rejecting moral oughts? They are almost identical in how they operate. This can be explained by an example. If someone replies to this video with an argument for moral relativism, and I decide to reply, they will assume epistemic duties must be present in our debate. For instance, they will assume that I ought not misrepresent their argument and pretend to have refuted them. I cannot rely on logical fallacies, I should be honest in responding to what they say, and not lie. The moral skeptic assumes these things ought to be done in a philosophical debate. They prescribe epistemic duties such as these and believe they should be kept and abided by. But that is precisely the problem. Why should I if it is all relative? Some could object that we hold to these epistemic duties because they have pragmatic value in discussing what is true and reasonable, not because they are objectively binding. If you don't want to abide by them, it shows you don't value reason and truth. So we do it because it is pragmatic. But all I have to ask is why is it the case that we ought to be pragmatic? Why is the skeptic prescribing this duty? Is it honorable and right to try and be pragmatic in reasonable debates? Why should we value reason and truth? We are still assuming epistemic duties that are objectively binding. So if you are a non-realist and you've ever claimed that someone did something wrong in misrepresenting your argument, then you've assumed epistemic virtues or duties while arguing such duties are either subjective or not real, you are prescribing that honesty should be objectively binding in philosophical or even scientific discussions. However, this epistemic virtue is tied to our moral virtue of honesty. So you cannot reject realism and assume it is wrong for me to misrepresent your argument, because again, you reject honesty as being objectively binding, and therefore it should serve no value in a real-world debate. However, since in reality, we agree there are epistemic duties and values used in discussions, we therefore agree moral duties and facts are objective. Building on that, the second argument is from experience. You would be hard pressed to find someone who can actually live out moral subjectivism. Even the actions of Sartre reveal this. Sartre was no moral realist, but argued for justice and spoke out against the horrors of genocide. But why? He claimed he chose this for himself, but why does he try to enforce his views on others who chose something different? If it is all subjective, then why should it matter how other people are treated if it doesn't affect you? Why do many moral subjectivists claim it is wrong to enslave women in some Middle Eastern countries when they are not in those countries or affected by them? Do not these other cultures have a right to make up what is moral for them? Yet we don't live like slavery and the mutilation of women is okay just because it is in a different culture. We actively condemn it. Declaring them wrong in their actions is to say they are wrong in their moral views and must conform to a different form of morality. But don't you realize what this means? This means we think there are people in the world who are doing things we believe they should stop regardless of what they personally believe about the correctness of their behavior. If that is so, then doesn't that most likely mean we believe there is some kind of moral reality that is not defined by humans that must be abided by regardless of what a person thinks? I would think so. The reality is people cannot simply live out moral subjectivism. 
So, if no one lives like moral subjectivism is true, and instead condemns the actions of others, then given this piece of evidence, it is more likely moral realism is true, since people who claim to be non-realists simply cannot act out their position in moral experience or even when using epistemic duties, and actions speak louder than words. If our experience infers realism, then the next argument works in a similar way. It is the argument from the problem of moral disagreement. Not only do we act as if moral realism is true, we also converse as if certain moral views are right, whereas others are wrong. If non-realism is true, then we have to accept the mutilation of little girls in some parts of Africa, or the values of the KKK, are equal to that of ours. In other words, we cannot disagree with them. We have no right to tell them they are wrong, or try to stop them, and therefore cannot argue our view of morality is superior. As Andrew Fisher says, Consider an example. Imagine that I claim that late-term abortion is morally wrong, but you claim it is not. Common sense tells us that we cannot both be right, and that one of us must have made a mistake. If moral realism is false, and late-term abortions do not have either the property of being right, or the property of being wrong, then it is hard to see why we cannot accept that we both could be right. In other words, we might think that moral realism is the best explanation for why we hold that an act cannot both be right and non-right, both good and not good, and so on. The point is, we don't simply prefer one or the other. We actually disagree with detestable acts of genocide, because we truly think other views are wrong, and there is a right action to take when asked to commit something horrid like genocide. So since we disagree with other views of morality, and consider them to be either wrong or right, then it is more likely moral realism is true. If this was not the case, there would be no reason to disagree, since all would be subjective, and the cultures that oppress women would just be other ways to view the moral landscape. Again, as with experience, actions speak louder than words. Andrew Fisher builds on this with a similar argument. It is the argument for moral progress. Moral progress can only make sense in terms of realism. The majority of people no longer think it is acceptable to enslave other races or murder people just because they are of a different tribe. If we consider this as progress, it would only make sense if we were slowly working towards an objective moral standard and not just arbitrarily changing morality. Fisher explains this by saying, if there is progress, this seems to imply that we are somehow moving closer to the truth of how the world actually ought to be. But if moral realism is false, then it seems that there could be no standard or benchmark, and it is hard to see why we would think moral progress was possible at all. Just like science is advancing us closer to finding out the theory of how the universe works, moral progress is advancing us in finding out what is morally true. If we think progress is being made, or we are encouraging moral progress, then we imply moral realism is true. This is also backed up by moral convergence. A common argument used against moral realism is the fact that cultures disagree on what morality is. Certain sects of Islam agree that it is okay to enslave women, and certain African tribes believe it is okay to murder deformed infants. Certain fundamentalist groups do not think it is right for us to take medication when we're sick. Therefore, morality seems to be defined by the culture. But that is not really an argument against moral realism. In the same way, the fact that different cultures have different views on the shape of the earth, that doesn't mean science is subjective and there is no objective shape of the earth that we can study and learn about. And second, cultural differences on morality are not typically real moral differences, but factual differences. For example, these radical Islamic extremists do not believe women have souls, therefore it is okay to oppress them. They do not think slavery of what they call human is right, they merely have an underlying factual error in their thinking, which transfers to their moral ideas. Certain African tribes do not think it is actually good to murder infants, but think deformed infants are possessed by evil spirits, or actually are evil spirits. They have factual errors, which cause them to act as they do. It is their beliefs about the facts, not morality, that causes them to think what ought to be done. So in reality, when given factual clarification, culturals tend to widely agree on basic moral facts. 
If you convince a tribe that a neighboring rival tribe is of the same human family as they are, they tend to change their views on if they should be killed off or not. A lot of moral progress has resulted from adjusting underlying factual errors, not changing moral views. So in reality, once factual errors are corrected or overlooked, morality in different cultures converges. Fisher says, imagine we put 50 people from around the world in individual rooms and ask them to think up the 10 most important moral rules. Again, I suspect there will be a large amount of convergence. For example, they all might write that it is wrong to steal, or wrong to kill children, or wrong to enslave people. Although the list would not be identical, there would certainly be much overlap. A good reason would be that there really are certain moral properties, and that they have been recognized by the people in the rooms. So when factual differences are resolved, moral beliefs do seem to converge, supporting the idea there are objective moral facts we humans are discovering and verifying through moral progress. Finally, building on all these previous arguments, we have to remember moral realism is intuitive. Moral facts and duties are simply self-evident and intuitive. If we see a child getting tortured, none of us would think that is simply how other people see the world and we should move on. No, we all feel that must be stopped and justice should be done. But why? Because the idea moral facts and duties are real and objective is self-evident and is our intuitive starting point. See, the burden is on the skeptic to show that our intuitions are wrong, not the moral realist. So even if I didn't have any other arguments for moral realism, this point on intuition would remain. It is the skeptic that bears the burden of proof in this instance to show us our intuitive starting point is wrong. This is the point many philosophers make, theists and atheists alike. Richard Boyd says, in the sciences, we decide between theories on the basis of observations, which have an important degree of objectivity. It appears that in moral reasoning, moral intuitions play the same role which observations do in science. We test general moral principles and moral theories by seeing how their consequences conform or fail to conform to our moral intuitions about particular cases. David Brink says, our moral thinking and discourse might be systematically mistaken, but this would be a revisionary conclusion to be accepted only as a result of extended and compelling argument that the commitments of ethical objectivity are unsustainable. In the meantime, we should treat the objectivity of ethics as a kind of default assumption or working hypothesis. This should also be obvious because we do this with every other topic. For example, we do not assume skepticism about our experience of the physical world unless we are given reason to. It is possible you are just a butterfly dreaming you are a human, but there is no good evidence to suggest it. So why accept a skeptical attack on intuition if there is no evidence to support it? Possibility is not probability. Likewise, we do not doubt our intuitive trust of our five senses unless we have a good reason to think that one of them has failed us. So why should we doubt our intuitive sense of moral facts unless we are given good reason by moral non-realists to do so? So in this case, the burden is on the skeptic who wants to argue moral realism is false. Unless they can give us a good reason that female mutilation is not objectively wrong, or that our moral intuitions should be doubted, their argument is dead in the water. Likewise, neither should our experience, moral disagreement, moral progress and convergence, or epistemic duties favor concluding our intuitions on moral facts and duties are wrong. On the contrary, they only support our intuitive beliefs about morality. The skeptic has to mount an argument not just assume the moral realist must bear the burden of proof and lack any reason to hold to their position. Nor can they just assume their wider metaphysical belief is true and incompatible with moral realism, so therefore moral realism cannot be true. This is sadly how many layman moral skeptics argue. They just assume moral realism is incompatible with their materialistic or similar beliefs, therefore there cannot be objective moral facts. That in itself is just a form of assuming your conclusion and not making a case for an alternative to moral realism. Until the skeptics do, moral realism is intuitively true and the best explanation of the moral landscape.